three, two, one. So, Bram, happy to have you here. Thanks for the invitation. I'd like to ask you about sepsis. So what are the most important changes to the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines? There were a few important changes in the last uh, iteration. Uh, I was involved in the 2016 guidelines as one of the methodologists. Um, it's definitely an area of interest of mine. I wasn't involved in the last iteration, but have uh, closely reviewed them. I think some of the major advances, uh, one around volume of fluid to be administered. And I think that following early goal-directed therapy in the early 2000s, there was a big transition to perhaps overzealous fluid administration. And, you know, we recognize the importance of early upfront fluids that was perhaps taken too far and patients would receive liters upon liters of, of fluids in that uh, six hour golden period. And so I think that we've learned in the last little while the harm of, of too much fluid as well for resuscitation. And that there's likely some patients that just require pressors for hypotension uh, in the early period related to systemic inflammation and loss of uh, systemic vascular resistance. And so um, in the past where we had made strong recommendations for large volumes like 30 mils per kilo for every patient that walks in the door with septic shock, the latest guidelines recognize that there's uncertainty around this. That 30 mils per kilo, which is a relatively arbitrary number, still appears in the latest iteration. However, now probably more accurately displayed as a conditional or weak recommendation. And there's more nuance discussing about how there might be patients that 30 mils per kilo is actually too much. And we need to be more judicious with resuscitation uh, and perhaps even look at transitioning to de-resuscitation earlier on. One of the other uh, big areas that has undergone uh, new data and one that's passionate to me is type of fluid when it comes to resuscitation. And I think that there's been increasing data to support the idea that perhaps balanced crystalloid may be optimal compared to saline. However, you've likely seen the largest randomized control trials that have been published in the last year. This actually since surviving sepsis latest iteration came out that show uh, in totality no difference between uh, saline and balanced crystalloid at least from a p-value perspective. But when you look at the subgroup from the meta-analysis that was published as well, if there's one subgroup that might benefit from balanced crystalloid, it's uh, the sepsis subgroup. And in fact, we're running uh, a randomized control trial, uh, which is active in Canada and now expanding to international sites, hopefully uh, Poland soon, looking at balanced crystalloid versus saline specifically in the septic shock population. But within surviving sepsis, this last iteration, there was a conditional or weak recommendation to use balanced fluids as compared to saline. I think those are some of the biggest changes associated with the last iteration. Thank you. So uh, maybe... Uh we could uh, go sideways and uh, uh, I would like to ask you one question about uh, fluid mega trials. What do you think about uh, the whole concept and how should we, how should we study uh, interventions which, ha which have potentially very small differences uh, in, in mortality or other outcomes? Yeah, it's incredibly challenging, you know, and, and we've seen um, a couple of these large fluid trials uh, in the last little while. And, you know, I think especially you're exactly right is that you take interventions that if they're going to have an effect on mortality, it's likely small, it makes it exceedingly difficult to show a difference uh, in this outcome. And so I think that there's a couple of things that we can do differently uh, in the future, perhaps to get to more efficient trials and addressing these questions. One would be uh, prognostic enrichment and really focusing on uh, subpopulations that we think are most likely to benefit from specific interventions. And this works for, for fluids, but, you know, thromboembolic trials looking at agents to decrease risk of clotting. It works for, for all sorts of different interventions where we really try and narrow in based on prognostic research and primarily observational prognostic research on populations that are uh, most likely to benefit. And so for example, now with intravenous fluids, we think maybe the sepsis subgroup is one that is most likely to show benefit. Uh, we know 
traumatic brain injury folks, perhaps there's a signal against balanced crystalloid and, and more for saline. And so, and we know that if you're going to show a difference, it's probably most likely to be seen in the highest risk group, those that are likely to get larger volumes. And this was some of the motivation behind our uh, interest in the randomized control trial I described before, which we call FISH, in that we're really focusing on sepsis because we think that that's a group that if there is going to be benefit, it would be in that group. And we're focusing on septic shock specifically, again, acknowledging that these are patients that are very sick with high rates of mortality um, and uh, will require smaller numbers of patients to show a difference, larger volume of fluid intervention. The other thing I think is that you're exactly right is that it's hard to show mortality difference in ICU trials. If you look over the last 20, 30 years of the number of trials that have shown a mortality reduction in critical care, it's exceedingly small, the number of trials. And so sometimes we have to sit back, I think, and ask ourselves whether mortality is the right outcome to study. And it's it's become inherent in the critical care world that, you know, we don't pay attention to trials unless they focused on mortality. But um, there are certainly, I'm not advocating for surrogate outcomes, but there are certainly other outcomes that are patient important that might also be key to study for some of these interventions. Amount of time in the ICU, amount of time on life support, functional status at one month, six months, quality of life. Uh, these are all outcomes that, that patients would find important. And although we might not see a difference in mortality, if we were able to show difference in some of these other outcomes, I think it would still matter. So I think those are a couple of ways that we might be molding in the future to help uh, prevent these large mega trials that are persistently negative, quote unquote. Yeah, until you analyze it with Bayesian statistics, right? <laughs> no doubt. And and I think that there's, listen, I mean, I'm a, a grade methodologist and, and uh, there's a lot of overlap between grade and Bayesian statistics in terms of looking at the way our priors and the way we used to think, applying the latest data and then not being contrived to p-value and statistical significance, but rather informing our best guess as what is the best intervention. And so we've been doing this for years, but it's nice to see with, you know, new analytic methods using Bayesian analysis that we're able to bring more mainstream this idea that we have to make decisions based on the best evidence available to us. Fantastic, Bram. Uh, we've spoken about outcomes. I have one question, SOFA, so Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. Is it a good surrogate outcome? Uh, if you see a difference in SOFA, does it matter? I think in general, patients do care about uh, organ dysfunction, probably more than even organ dysfunction, they would care about the need for life support. And there's a couple of uh, uh, other composite outcomes, one actually done by Canadians looking at uh, days free of organ support. Um, and I think that I would argue that's probably even more important to patients. You can tell a patient that their platelet level, which is one of the aspects of the SOFA score or their creatinine is dysfunctional. That will matter a slightly perhaps to patients, but the more uh, pressing for them would be, am I going to be bleeding and require a large transfusion? Am I going to require dialysis or mechanical ventilation? So I think there are ways to spin perhaps SOFA to more focus on, again, the implications to patients rather than the organ failure itself. Yeah, it sounds very reasonable. Thanks. So let's go back to, to our main topic. Steroids is another area I'm passionate about and in the topic in case you wanted to discuss Cuba, but it's please, up to you. Please, let's uh, let's talk about <laughs> steroids and sepsis. What's your approach? Yeah, I think I'm. Uh, we did some work in this area. Um, I published a meta-analysis in critical care medicine, um, which we'll discuss in the talk. Um, I'm, I'm probably more of a proponent of uh, steroids in the setting of sepsis and septic shock than others, and not with Previous, I think, approach to using steroids were this idea of relative adrenal insufficiency. I certainly don't buy into that as my primary indication for giving steroids, but rather we know based on the most recent definitions for sepsis is that the majority of the pathogenesis comes from dysregulated immune function. You know, the bacteria is only there, it gets killed by the antibiotics, but much of the organ dysfunction is because your immune system becomes hyperactivated um, and the sequelae leads from that. And so when I use steroids, corticosteroids and sepsis, I use it not for a relative adrenal insufficiency, but rather to help regulate the host immune response downregulate IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, while still hopefully retaining the effective aspects of the host immune response. And at least from our meta-analysis suggested uh, perhaps a signal for mortality reduction with corticosteroids. And, you know, there's a big body of evidence looking at steroids and sepsis. Um, even now with uh, adrenal um, and approaches, the French study, 
was something like 10,000 patients across 46 randomized control trials. Um, and so when you put those all together, which we did on our meta-analysis, there was a signal for a 7% reduction in mortality with corticosteroids. Uh, there was imprecision associated with this and the upper end of the confidence interval did just cross one. Despite this, there was a, a strong signal for a reduction in SOFA score, so organ dysfunction, and a reversal of uh, shock. And so I am very liberal with giving a short course of corticosteroids for patients with uh, septic shock. Um, you know, I think we, I'm trained as an internist, we always worry about the negative sequelae of corticosteroids, but treatment for two, three, four days with corticosteroids is associated with quite minimal side effects in, in truth. Um, maybe some metabolic derangements, but in the ICU, these are relatively easily treatable. Uh, and you know what? Most interestingly, Kuba, is that we saw a consistency in treatment effect across severities of sepsis. So even if I see perhaps somebody not in shock, but with sepsis and organ dysfunction, I will often still treat with corticosteroids, knowing that I perhaps can reverse that organ dysfunction uh, with short course. So you start early. Uh, to, so do you have any threshold or you individualize a uh, moment when you give steroids? A little bit individualized. Certainly, I think if somebody is ending up in the intensive care unit with uh, primary diagnosis sepsis, I'm giving them a course of corticosteroids, even if they are not quite yet needing vasopressors, but again, have signs of acute kidney injury, acute liver failure, acute delirium, or some sort of end organ dysfunction that I can specifically say I believe is related to sepsis, I will often uh, start a course of corticosteroids. Certainly if patients are on vasopressors, I'm, I'm starting a short course. Um, and then sometimes even if I'm on our outreach team and I'm up on the ward trying to prevent a patient from coming to the intensive care unit, uh, sometimes I will give a short course. I'm sure next questions might be, what do you use and how long and what dose? Um, you know, I don't, we did subgroup analysis based on these questions for our meta-analysis and it did not seem to matter what dose, which steroid, but the majority of the trials used hydrocortisone in the range of 50 to 200 milligrams per day. So I do tend to use hydrocortisone 50 Q6 or 50 Q8. Um, and if it's somebody who's on pressors, I'll usually stop when they come off pressors. If it's somebody just with organ failure, I'll usually give for 48 hours. And then if they're improving, stop. Again, I don't think that there's any magic between behind that dose or duration, but rather the most common regime that was used amongst the studies. Thank you, bro. We've seen a change in uh, these guidelines uh, motivated by the sensor trial. So what is your approach to peripheral pressors? Yeah, I think that uh, there has been some systematic reviews in this area that suggest that our inherent uh, want to avoid peripheral pressors is perhaps misguided and the true risk for extravasation is low. You know, I'm, I'm certainly of a mindset in the IC world that less is more. And I, I often find that the, the more we just let patients get better on their own and keep our hands off, the better it is for everybody. You know, we've learned this lesson so many times with intensive glucose control and higher tidal volumes and more renal replacement therapy is that the more we just sit back and, and do less, uh, the better patients get. And so I think if I can avoid putting in a central line in somebody, I will certainly uh, try to avoid. Now, I think if somebody's on uh, low dose vasopressors and you feel optimistic that with some steroids and fluid, you'll be able to get off in, in 24 or 48 hours, I have no problem running um, uh, peripheral pressors in this setting. I think if we need the access for other reasons or we think that this is going to be more of prolonged therapy, somebody who's much more sick, uh, we still will obviously place uh, central access. But I'm, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with uh, uh, peripheral pressors. And there's other unique solutions, you know, midline uh, intravenous access, auxiliary lines. There's, there's other options that are somewhat halfway between central access and peripheral access. Perfect. Thank you, Bram. So uh, Zentensivist approach? Is this... Uh, yes, exactly. You got it. The Zentensivist. The uh, topic, uh, yeah, Twitter made famous via social media, 100%. Yeah. Right. Great. So uh, my last question, what about a uh, one hour bundle? Um, is it, uh, sh sh should we mentally like um, have it in our head? It's uh, this one hour, it's, it's taking and what should we do in, uh, in this time? I think we've come down to appreciate, uh, Kuba, the importance of early fluids and antibiotics. And, and I won't, I, I think that having a threshold or an important, you know, tr wanting to prioritize those interventions is, is certainly a good thing. I mean, you probably know you look at the literature and it's hard to find direct data specifically supporting one hour, three hour uh, and timing. But um, so I think that 
Uh, I do think that it's good uh, to prioritize those those concepts of especially early antibiotics and and then fluids, perhaps early fluid trial. But then, as we've discussed previously, tailoring the amount of fluid therapy uh, to the patient. And that can be challenging, too, because, as you know, there's no perfect test to decide what patient is going to be volume responsive and what patient is not going to be volume responsive. And it often comes down to trial and error. Um, you know, you give a bolus and you look for improvements in, in per markers of uh, uh, perfusion. And if you see them, you're more motivated to give more. But so, you know, I, I can't prescribe to the one hour specific volumes of fluid, but I think uh, prioritizing fluid and antibiotics quickly in sepsis is good. Great. Thank you, Bram. And what about capillary refill time? Uh, do you optimize your resuscitation using this measure? Or? I have a uh, slide for cap refill in my uh, talk. And, you know, I, I think that it's certainly interesting, especially after Andromeda uh, came out. And, um, you know, I think that there's other reasons uh, why the those that were randomized to cap refill may have done better. One, they did get less fluid, but certainly you might be aware that part of the protocol mandated a physician at the patient's bedside every 30 minutes checking cap refill. There are other benefits of having a physician at the bedside mandated every 30 minutes, and, and perhaps some of that uh, came out. So I, I'll be honest, personally, I don't use cap refill as part of my routine practice, um, but I'm not sure that I have good reason for avoiding it. And, and if I was in a center that uh, did not have as immediate availability of blood testing, lactate levels, um, more invasive measures of uh, perfusion, then perhaps I would feel comfortable using it. And that was one of the unique things of Andromeda, right? It was done in Latin America by centers that didn't have as much availability of some of these other uh, tools to assess volume responsiveness and showed that you know a simple tool like that was just as good as, as other more invasive tests, which was really neat. Right. I think Andromeda 2 is uh, underway. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. Glenn Hernandez is working on it. So it'll be exciting to see what they come up with next. Sure. We've all got a lot of content from you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.